Wonderful having this kind of weather in the month of January. Wow, it's been amazing. We had a wonderful day yesterday. I had the opportunity to, to um, go up to the Marion County Correctional Institute with the group Forevermore. This was not a trip sponsored by Grace Bible Church. It, the uh, chaplain up there had, we have been up there before. Our church has been up there and done ministry up there, but um, the chaplain up there asked the ladies to sing uh, at the final night of their revival. They've had a revival actually every night this, week, uh, this past week at the prison through the chaplain and the chapel services. They've been having a revival. And so he asked the ladies to, to be the final singers at the last night of the revival. And um, so I went with them and Liz Gresham went with them just to help them unload, load, go through, the, the, get in and out and etc. But um, th I wasn't preaching. I had the opportunity to sit back and be an observer this time. And the, past the preacher, he wasn't a pastor, the preacher was actually a former inmate of that institution. He had spent 19 years in Marion County Correctional Institute. He got saved there, dedicated his life to the Lord, started attending the chapel services, being discipled by the chaplain and, and the services, gave his life to Christ, made decisions for Christ, and when he got out, when he was released, decided he wanted to go back and try to help inmates come to know Christ as their Savior and make decisions for the Lord. So he goes in about five to six times a year. Um, it was interesting to hear how the Lord has worked in his life because uh, Tallahassee, um, I, I don't know if you call it revoked or what, did away with his probation. He had five years left of probation and still... Uh, owed some money for something and Tallahassee waived all of that so that he could go into the prisons because he can't go in if he's on probation and just it was it, really a, a neat experience and to hear he, he preached the gospel and he did so in a way that I would not be able to do. I mean he was able to make some relevant applications to their everyday life in prison since he spent 19 years there. But what was encouraging, what was encouraging is you know sometimes you go in and we've seen a lot of decisions in the past with with our ministry but you always wonder you know how genuine was it will it stick and what will happen in the future and of course some of that's just simply up to God and and we shouldn't worry about that but here was an individual who got saved in prison and who is now serving the Lord outside of prison and it was just encouraging to see that you know God is at work in all sorts of places and and in all sorts of people and um, we have to be careful sometimes of being skeptical um, of things. Um, God can work in the hearts of anybody and, and regardless of their situation. So it was just a neat experience yesterday. It was a, a neat time getting to see how the Lord was working. And a lot of people responded. Uh, not so much, uh, it was the last night, I, I, so I, I don't know what happened on previous nights, not in a salvation sense, but he gave an invitation. One young man did go up for salvation, but several went up to make decisions for the Lord. And so it was a neat time, very neat time. Well, have you ever been hurt by a lie? Have you ever been hurt by a lie or by deception? Has someone ever told you something as if it was truth and you later found out it wasn't true? Maybe it was some legal advice. Maybe it was business advice. Maybe it was marital advice or some other area of life where somebody told you something that you assumed to be true because they said it was true only to find out later it was not true and in the process you may have suffered. Many of us have. And when people bend the truth, somebody almost always suffers. In this morning, I'd like to begin a study on a new epistle, a very short epistle in the New Testament, one of the shortest, um, and talk about truth and the importance of truth. But before we do that, I want to emphasize the fact that on the past several Sunday nights as we've been studying through the book of Philippians on Sunday evenings, we have been approaching the new year, the year of 2013, with an emphasis on what Paul taught in relationship to his goal as a believer and what I believe ought to be the goal of every believer as Paul states it in Philippians chapter 3. And so I just want to remind you, and for those of you that don't come on Sunday nights, Listen to what Paul says here in Philippians chapter 3 that he said was his goal and that ought to be a part of our goal for not only 2013 but for our lives. 
in verse 7 it says, But whatever was to my profit I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already attained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. The main goal of the individual believer ought to be the same as that of the Apostle Paul, which he expresses here, and that is to be consumed with knowing Christ better. To be consumed with knowing Christ better. But in order to know Christ better, we have to do at least three things. First of all, we have to have a relationship with Him. You cannot know Christ without having a relationship with Him. You can know about Him, but you cannot know Him. Secondly, we need to learn more about Him as we want our relationship to deepen, to become more passionate, more committed. We have to know more about Him. It's the same as having a relationship with an individual, with a human being. In order to have that relationship deepen, there has to be some sort of communication. In fact, one of the keys, most marriage therapists say one of the keys to a successful marriage is communication. And how often do you hear somebody saying, well, my husband just never talks to me. All he does is come home from work, plops down on the sofa, or in the lazy boy, turns on the TV and tunes out. And I try to talk to him, but he's had a busy day and doesn't want to listen. Or maybe it's the opposite. Usually I think the ladies want to talk about things and the guys just sort of, okay, okay, go ahead and talk. And, and, and they hear it in the background. Da, 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 da. And then their wife says, well, remember I talked to you about it? And they, no, I don't remember you talking to me about it. <laughs> well, I did. Well, I didn't hear you. Well, that ought to be assumed to some extent. <laughs> to get to know someone better, we have to spend time with them. That's the third point. We have to spend time with them. So we have to have a relationship with them. We have to learn more about them. And we have to spend time with them. In order to spend time with that person or to get to know more about them, there must be some sort of body of revelation or source of truth or source of communication about that person. The source of truth about Jesus Christ that reveals Him to us is the Scriptures. We have in written form the truth that was relayed to the apostles and then passed on to others. This is the faith that Jude is talking about in his epistle. The reason we are to contend for the faith, to struggle to see that it is transmitted correctly and taught correctly, is so that men and women can truly come to know Jesus Christ better and to live in a manner that truly pleases Him. And so while on Sunday evenings we're talking about knowing Christ better as we study the book of Philippians, on Sunday morning we'll be talking about truth, the truth that helps us to know Christ more intimately. And so let's take a look at what Jude has to say about the importance of truth in his epistle, in his letter. Turn to the book or the, the page of Jude in many of your Bibles, as it is only one chapter in length. And this morning I'd like to simply concentrate on the first four verses and specifically on verse four. Jude chapter one, or the only chapter. Jude verses 1 through 4. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. 
Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only Sovereign and Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we live in a day and age where people want to be told the truth and hate deception and hate error until it comes to the Scriptures. And then it's almost like anything goes. Like as long as we love each other, who really cares about what the truth is? And so, Father, I pray that this morning we would wake up to the importance of truth if we've been asleep to it, that we would maybe be stirred afresh as to the need to know the truth and to defend the truth, to contend for it, as Jude says here, to hold it up, to promote it, to proclamate it, and to pass it on in such a way that it's preserved in its original um, its original truthfulness. But Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our lives to help us to hear and to obey your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the greatest dangers to the truth is false doctrine. It has been the attempt of Satan from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 to distort the truth. Right from the very beginning of time, Satan's, or one of Satan's, major weapons was deceit, specifically in relationship to what God had communicated to human beings. Satan loves to take the Word of God and twist it and distort it and turn it into a lie. And so as Adam and Eve were in the garden living for God, Satan appears on the scene in chapter 3 and says, Has God really said and then takes the Word of God and twists it, and you and I now live in a state of sinfulness in a fallen and cursed world because of what Satan did. When we begin to think that truth doesn't matter, just think back to Genesis chapter 3, and then think of your lives that you live today, because otherwise, if it wasn't for that lie that was believed by Eve and quite possibly by Adam, it never tells us whether Adam believed it or not, he did give in to it, but if it wasn't for that, you and I would still be living in the Garden of Eden without having to go to a job every day and listen to a boss that's yelling at you or mad at you or upset with you or listen to customers that are mad at you or upset with you. We wouldn't be paying taxes on the land. We'd live freely. The, the ground would bring forth its fullness. We would still work, but I don't know that we'd have to do an 8 to 5 or 9 to 5 type of job. But... Um, the, the ground would bring forth its fullness. There'd be no pain in childbirth, ladies. You'd be able to have 15, 20, 25 babies, as many as you... I know, you're, you're shaking your head. No way. Why? Because one is painful enough, right? Two or three, that's pushing the limits. Four or five, it's time to give up. It just hurts so much. But imagine if there was no pain in childbirth. You see, we live with the daily repercussions of deceit. When somebody says, well, I don't know that the truth really matters, folks, think about the situation we live in today. One little twist of the truth. All Satan did was add one word to what God has said. Satan simply said, God, uh, as God said, and he goes on and he says, you shall not. God said in the day they ate of it, they would die. He says, you shall not die. He added the word not which directly contradicted what God said and in the process we incur a fallen world and a sinful nature and condemnation. In fact, what's worse than this life is the fact that now multiple people end up in hell, wake up in hell every day because of a lie that Satan promoted at the beginning of time that man believed and that has affected all of us today. Truth matters. One of the greatest dangers to the truth is false doctrine. Satan is called the father of lies in John chapter 8 verse 44. And yet Jesus 
is the author of truth. In fact, over 30 times in the Gospel of Matthew alone, and it is a repeating phrase throughout all of the Gospels, we see this phrase, I tell you the truth. 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 Over and over again, we see that in the Scriptures. Jesus also said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In John 17, 17, he prays, Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. In Matthew chapter 24, we see the opposite of truth. We see the danger of false teaching and false prophets and the fact that they will appear on the scene to distort the truth. Jesus warned his followers that false teachers would come teaching false things. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 11, it says, At that time, and this is Jesus speaking, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. People who will pretend to be people of God. Prophets. And yet they will promote lies and deception and deceive people so that they will depart from the faith. In Acts chapter 20, Paul, Paul, maybe thinking back to what Christ had said and what he had heard through other disciples, or maybe simply through the inspiration of the Spirit of God alone, says this to the disciples he addressed in Acts chapter 20, verse 30. He says, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. It was a major, apparently, part of Paul's preaching to warn other believers about the possibility of error and false teaching creeping in among them. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see Paul doing the same thing. In, in verse 4, when he says, They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Not only did Jesus and Paul warn believers, but so did Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Peter says, But there will also be false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. Peter doesn't talk about these men as being simple, nice men who have maybe been led astray and are now in ignorance leading others astray. He says that these false teachers are introducing destructive heresies that bring swift destruction upon themselves and oftentimes on those who follow their teachings. You see, truth matters so much because truth can determine our destiny. Truth may determine whether or not that person is going to heaven or to hell. As they listen to the gospel, if it is a distorted gospel, a perverted gospel, a gospel that is not accurate to the Scriptures, a gospel that denies the Lord Jesus Christ, a gospel that includes works as a means of salvation, then that person's destiny may still be hell even though they think they may be going to heaven. Truth is also important because it affects the way we live our daily lives. Truth is important because it's in its basic simplicity, the most important reason why, is it's one of the characteristics of God. And we're told to be imitators of God in Ephesians chapter 1. It is impossible, the scriptures say, for God to lie. God is a God of truth. Jude understood this. Now the Jude that we're looking at here in, in your Bibles, the last book of the Bible before the book of Revelation, we believe to be the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. I say half-brother because obviously... Um, his, his father was an earthly father, Joseph, whereas Jesus' father was God Almighty. And so we believe this to be the half-brother of Jesus. Jude is the English form of the Greek name for Judas. In fact, if you were to pick up a, a Greek text, this would literally 
be, uh, in verse 1, it wouldn't say Judas, servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. It would say Judas. Judas is the Greek form, but Judah is the Hebrew form. And so in his day and age, the author of this epistle would have been addressed by his contemporaries, by those people who were Jewish at least, as Judah. Judah was his Hebrew name, and it meant encouragement. It was a popular name because of the tribe of Judah, and because of Judas the Maccabean, called a nickname the Hammer, a hero during the Maccabean Revolt. He was one of the first Jewish people to institute what we might call today guerrilla warfare. Rome, uh, the Greeks were too big and too powerful. Rome, it wasn't Rome at this time. It was Antiochus Epiphanes and the, the Greeks that had overrun that particular area and were in control. And, and uh, Judas Maccabean led small groups of Jewish um, soldiers, of people who have revolted, of anybody who would join the cause in, in, in a guerrilla type of warfare where they would attack a band of Greeks and then run. They, they would do it in stealth and they would hide and it's, a, it's interesting to read the history. It's been a long time, but in my college days, I remember reading about the Maccabean re revolt and uh, the uh, war tactics of Judas Maccabeus. And so he became a hero, and so his name was popular. It's not popular to us. We, nobody would want to name their kid Judas because we think of who when we think of Judas? We think of one Judas in the Bible, although there are eight Judases in the Bible. We think of one, Judas Iscariot. And nobody, nobody wants to be associated with him because he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if there are eight Judes or Judases or Judas in the Hebrew in the New Testament, uh, how do we know this is the Lord's brother? Well, because only two of them were associated with someone named James. One of the Judes in the New Testament was the son of James. And, the, the, and, so, and that was one of the apostles. And so the other Jude is this Jude that we see here who was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not one of the apostles. In fact, he seems to distinguish himself from the apostles in verse 17. Not that he is in any type of disagreement with them, but simply by the way he refers to the apostle, he doesn't include himself among them. In verse 17 it says, But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. And so he speaks of it almost as in a, a, um, a third person. They, remember what they told you, not including himself in the apostles. Jude begins his plead here for contending for doctrinal purity by addressing his audience in such a way that they would understand who they are in Christ and in a way that clearly distinguishes them from the f false professors who were distorting the truth. And so in verse 1 it says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, and a brother of James to those who have been and by the way you may say well, why did he just call himself the servant of Jesus Christ uh, I, I don't know exactly it doesn't have, we can guess but probably for the same reason that James the author of the epistle of James who was also a half brother of Jesus Christ doesn't address himself as the brother of Jesus but as a servant of Jesus and that is is that they recognize Jesus was much more than their half brother much more than their half-brother. They recognized the deity and the sovereignty and the majesty of Jesus. And so they refer to him not as themselves. They don't say, yeah, my brother Jesus. <laughs> no, it, Jude, a servant of Jesus. A bond slave is the actual rendering here um, in Jude chapter 1. A bond slave of Jesus. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who have been called who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, and he goes on. He goes on. And so he identifies those that he's writing to as truly called by God, truly loved by God, truly kept by God. Note in verse 1, it says, kept by Jesus Christ. It is the preservation power of Jesus Christ that maintains our salvation, not our own works. We're not kept by our own works. We're kept by the grace and power of Jesus Christ. And so he distinguishes between those who are true believers and true followers of Jesus Christ and these false teachers that he will begin to identify in verse 4, identify further in verses after that, and then sum up as how, how we ought to then respond in relationship to the fact that there will be false teachers among us. 
Now he begins that a little bit even here early in verse 4. After he addresses and distinguishes the audience that he's writing to, he tells them to contend earnestly for the faith. Now that phrase, to contend earnestly, the word contend here is a very strong word. It's used only here. It's of late origin in the Greek language, and it's used only here in the New Testament. It is a compound word from two Greek words that gives it a strong emphasis. Jude wanted his readers to understand that this is important. And so he chooses a word that would emphasize the importance of it in their minds as Greek speakers and relay to them the, the, the need to contend for the faith. The word... The, the, word, the Greek word, the root word that's used here, I mentioned it's a compound word, but the root word that's used here, we get our English word agonize from. And what does it mean to agonize? Oh, I agonized over it day and night. It means it, it's, it's a labor sometimes mentally, sometimes physically, uh, but to give it your all, basically it consumes you, doesn't it? I agonized over that problem. I agonized over whatever. That's the root word from which we get this word that's used here, but it's only one of the words as it is a compound word. And so it emphasizes what Jude is saying, that there is a need to contend for the faith. Now what is the faith here? Well, it's not the faith in the initial sense of believing, but instead it, it seems to be making reference to that body of truth that has been delivered to the believers, first through the apostles, then through their disciples, and then in written form. It is the same thing that's spoken of in Galatians chapter 1, verse 23, where the apostle Paul says, the, they only heard the report that the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. It is that body of truth true Christian content that was passed on to us through the Lord Jesus Christ and through his apostles. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 we see another reference to it where it says whatever happens conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence I will know that you stand firm in one spirit contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. And so the faith is not some nebulous body of truth that nobody really can define and nobody's really sure where it begins and where it ends. It is the apostles' teaching. It's, it's that which we read about in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where it tells us that those who believe devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They recognized that this was the body of truth that God had communicated to the Lord Jesus Christ and His disciples that was for them today. And we have it with us in written form. In Eusebius's ecclesiastical history, written somewhere in the 300s A.D., we have Irenaeus' account of the origin of the Gospels. Irenaeus was the Bishop of Lyons. He was a disciple of Polycarp who was a disciple of the Apostle John. So you have the Apostle John who sat at the feet of Jesus. You have the Apostle John. You have his disciple Polycarp. And then you have Irenaeus. And here is what Irenaeus says about how we got the Gospels. He says, Matthew published his Gospel among Hebrews in their own language while Peter and Paul were preaching and founding the church in Rome. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, also transmitted to us in writing those things which Peter had preached. And Luke, the attendant of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel which Paul had declared. Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also reclined on his bosom, published his gospel while staying at Ephesus in Asia. And so here one of the third generation Christians, someone very close to the apostles who had heard the story transmitted to first Polycarp, his, his master or teacher, and then to himself, um, who, who knew that the way we got our gospels was through those people who heard it directly from the apostles themselves. Note that this faith that we're to contend for is said to have been once for all delivered to the saints. Now, that's a key phrase. Once for all delivered to the faith. That indicates a finality to the revelation given. This is not only the truth of God, 
it is all the truth of God that has been communicated to man. There is no, no other truth. Now you say, why is that so important? Well, I got a book in the mail just the other day. Brand new book called Jesus Christ's Message to All Nations. It's from the fundamentalist church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I don't know how I got on their mailing list. But <laughs> this is the sect that still practice, practices polygamy. And um, I do not practice polygamy. I have one wife, been married to her for 32 years, and I'm very happy with that. Um, but I, I don't know how, and it may be that they're sending it out to a lot of pastors because it, it claims to be a revelation of Jesus Christ to, uh, about the warnings to the government of the United States of America if they do not release the president of the fundamental church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There are two major sects in Mormonism. What we're talking about here is Mormonism today. Two major sects. One that doesn't practice polygamy anymore that all of a sudden got a revelation that okay we shouldn't do it although they did it for years from the founding from Joseph Smith on until the courts said okay we're going to start putting you in jail and then all of a sudden they got this revelation that okay maybe we shouldn't do this and then a sect that broke off from them that's still referred to as the fundamentalist church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who still believe that they are the Mormon and they're the Mormons that have held to the truth they still believe that pit polygamy was it was original teaching of Joseph Smith and uh, of those who succeeded him and so therefore it's the the truth of the gospel as they see it and listen to this little letter of introduction by the way um, President Warren Jeffs is in jail right now in Texas first he was arrested in Utah um, for um, the, the actual way that they worded it was that he was an accomplice in the rape of a 14 year old girl in his church whose marriage he presided over. Because he performed the wedding of a 14-year-old girl, an underage minor, to another man who then had sexual relationships with her, he was arrested as an accomplice and put in jail for performing the wedding. Now, there's somebody, maybe he didn't realize that could happen. Apparently he didn't realize that. Anyways, he went to jail. Um, the Utah Supreme Court overturned that saying the only way that he could be guilty as an accomplice is if he performed the wedding knowing for certain because it was a it was one of those um, spiritual weddings they have in Mormonism where you can marry a woman and never have physical relationships with her but if it's done in the in a Mormon temple it, it has an eternal lasting result so that she'll be your wife in eternity someday and so they can even the the other sect of Mormonism can still practice spiritual polygamy they can marry 10 wives here on earth and have what they call it spiritual weddings, never live with that woman, never have relationships with that woman, but those women will all be their wives in heaven so that they can propagate other planets with human beings in the future. This is true. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. No, this is, this is part of Mormon teaching. Uh, and um, yeah, but listen to how this is introduced. This is not introduced as the words of Warren Jeffs. By the way, he's back in prison. He's, he's back in jail because uh, they extradited him. They wanted to get him out of Utah because it's such a heavily Mormon-influenced state. And so they sent him to Texas, and he's in jail um, in, in Texas now um, because they've also accused him now with new charges of he himself having apparently sexual relations with underage women that he married. And so they're trying to discern the truth of it. So this is a warning from the Mormon church to the government if they don't release them. But listen to how it's worded. Because the Mormon church believes in ongoing revelation. They believe God is still communicating. This is not the full body of truth. We just saw Jude said, once for all delivered to the saints. I don't know what they do with that once for all. I'm sure they have a way of distorting it. But once for all means once for all. But this says, I, Jesus Christ, God over all world, do send my book of full warning to all legal order to use as full evidence my holy religion revealed through prophets, order, honor. And I don't know why the English is so broken like this. Either Warren Jeffs isn't very good with his English or he's trying to make it sound sort of King James's, you know? Because the Book of Mormon is that way. You ever, you know, the Book of Mormon was supposedly translated by Joseph Smith in um, what the 1800s early 1800s um, pardon 1830s and yet it's in King James English parts of it so you know did, did Joseph Smith speak in King James English 
Or what is with that? Or did he plagiarize parts of the Bible? Well, I'll tell you what he did. He plagiarized parts of the Bible. Some parts of the Book of Mormon read exactly like the Bible. And, and uh, yeah, several places. And so, but he goes on and, and he says, you know, I, I uh, addresses as if he's, Jesus, this is Jesus Christ speaking and he says he is, uh, that Warren Jeffs is innocent, let him go free soon so my church on earth has full leadership of key holding priesthood order as is found described in proclamation one, uh, in proclamation I sent to all peoples describing my even God, right to full holy legal preserving religion of heaven on on world, and this is the reading of it. And now do full reading to learn my revealed truth order, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes on. And then as you read through it, it says here in the preface, revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ given to President Warren S. Jeffs, Palestine, Texas, Monday, July 9th, 2012. And then it has several day after day after day of revelation given by Jesus Christ directly to Warren Jeffs. Well, man, if this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, I ought to buy multiple copies, which there's a handy order form in the back. (laughs) And distribute it to all of you. Right? If this is the teaching of Jesus, you ought to have it, be reading it and learning about it. If it's not the teaching of Jesus, we ought to be warning people. Don't believe that nonsense. Now, fortunately, primarily probably because of the belief of polygamy, a lot of people have dismissed the fundamentalist church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but not the other group. They both believe the same thing. They both believe the same thing except for on the issue of polygamy. One we dismiss as nonsense and uh, a bunch of kooks because of polygamy. The other we think is almost mainline religion now. After all, a presidential candidate held to those views. So they can't be all kooks, can they? And, I, and I, maybe I shouldn't use that word kook, because intelligent people can be deceived. Intelligent people can be deceived. Satan is a master of deception. And if we don't know the scriptures well, we can fall for almost anything. By the way, the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, both groups believe in ongoing revelation and they're not the only ones. You want to know who else? Who else believes in ongoing revelation and yet they won't state it the same way? The charismatic movement. All those people who claim that God has revealed to them some sort of truth that they then prophesy to the rest of the church or tell the other church that God has told them as if it was equal to Scripture. Now, though, quickly, when you say, when, and I've heard these prophecies, I've heard people, I've been to charismatic churches where I've heard individuals stand up and speak in tongues and then sit down and somebody else stand up and say, thus says the Lord. Wow. The Bible says, don't take the Lord God's name in vain. That means without meaning. That person, if God didn't really tell that person that, then they have just violated one of the Ten Commandments. And I would like to suggest to you that God hasn't told any of them that. You say, Pastor Dean, that's a pretty strong statement. There's a whole lot of good people out there that know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that go to church every Sunday, sometimes multiple times, and seem to be more dedicated than other Christians sometimes. Yes, I know that. And I believe many of them have fallen into error. Well, when you say, thus saith the Lord, you're in direct contradiction with what Jude says here, the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It's either a completed body of revelation or it's not. And if it's not, there are a whole myriad of people out there telling you what Jesus has told them. You got the Charismatics, you got the Mormons, you got every other Mary Baker Eddy and Christian Science. And uh, you ask, well, I don't know, maybe Gary can tell you some others, but there's a whole bunch of people out there that have ongoing revelation, that have more to tell you than what this says. This is it, folks. This is, all, this is what the church has held to for 1,800, 1,900 years as the sole body of truth until some of these cults are... Now, there were various factions and little splinter groups, cults that have always sprung up 
But until Mormonism, until Jehovah Witnesses, until Christian Science, until Seventh-day Adventism and some of the others that claimed revelation for the founder of those religions, direct revelation from God, we didn't have this emphasis on other sources of authority, extra biblical sources of authority. And these are people that still claim to believe the Bible. The Mormons will gladly, if you don't have one, get you a copy of the Bible. They would love for you to have a copy of the Bible because it's God's Word. And they'll tell you that. They'd also like for you to have a copy of the Book of Mormonism because it is more recent revelations, more recent prophecies revealed to Joseph Smith that help us to understand the Bible better. Just like the New Testament helps us to understand the Old Testament, the Book of Mormon helps us to understand the New Testament and the Old Testament better. That's what they'll tell you. The church is recognized for 1,900 years. This is it. This is it. Jude says, the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings of Moroni and Joseph Smith and Elder Jeffs. And No, it doesn't say that, does it? In 2 Thessalonians, you were getting worried there for a second. No. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. He doesn't include anybody else. He doesn't say, and listen to all those future day prophets who will come and receive extra biblical revelation from the Lord as well. Jude's warning to believers sounds very much like Peter's in his second epistle. We read part of it earlier. Peter says, but there will also be false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even in some cases, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. He goes on and he talks about their faith, and it's not a pretty fate. He says, He goes on and he says that uh, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons, that hell's not a topic people like to talk about anymore, to be held for judgment if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. A lot of times we give a a, a lot of bad rap. Here it says he was a righteous man distressed by the conversations and the wickedness around him. Verse 9, if this is so, the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature and despise authority. The Bible does not paint a pretty picture for people who would pervert God's truth by adding to it or distorting it or taking away from it. He says these people are false teachers whose condemnation is just. Now Jude begins to describe these individuals and in verse 4 we have five preliminary statements about these false teachers that pervert the word of God, that change it, that that turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And we'll, we'll see what that means here in just a minute. First of all, they are ordained to judgment. Again, verse 4. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago. Now, in some, in some early manuscripts, there's a variant reading for that, which says, um, or men who were marked out for condemnation. Um, most of the modern versions have whose condemnation was written about long ago. And, that, and that's the reading that I think is the best reading. Jude did not write that these men were ordained to become apostates as though God were responsible for their sin. They became apostates because they willfully turned away from the truth. But God did ordain that such people would be judged and condemned. The Old Testament prophets denounced the false prophets uh, of their day and both Jesus Christ and his apostles pronounced judgment on them. Why should these men be judged by God? To begin with, they had denied his son. That is reason enough for their condemnation. But they also defiled God's people by teaching them that God's grace permitted them to practice sin. That's what it means when it talks about 
uh, lasciviousness or a license for immorality here in verse 4. So first of all, they are ordained to judgment. Secondly, they are ungodly. Again, in verse 4, it says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality. This is one of Jude's favorite words. While these men claimed to belong to God, they were in fact ungodly in their thinking and their living. They might have had a form of godliness, but they lacked the true power of godliness in their lives. Thirdly, they were deceitful. In verse 4 again, it says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Now whether they knew exactly what they were doing the, the exact error of their ways um, and, and came in and purposefully did all that they did to distort the truth of Jesus Christ or whether they honestly believed it. I think maybe some people who pick up these books and read them, the Book of Mormon or, or others, I think sometimes they're, they're, just, they're honestly deceived. And then they go about their mission promoting their deception because they honestly believe it. Here, it seems like these people knowingly misled others because it says they secretly slipped in among you, godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ. So it seems that they did it knowingly. So they were deceitful. Fourth, they misuse, they misuse the grace of God. Again, verse 4, for certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality. This passage seems to warrant the idea that these people were distorting God's word or the practice of it on purpose to attempt to change the doctrine and turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. The word lasciviousness can be translated simply as wantonness or an absent an absence of moral restraint. We today might translate it with the word indecency. A person who is lascivious thinks only of satisfying his lust and whatever he touches is stained by his base appetites. Lasciviousness is one of the works of the flesh according to Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 and it proceeds from an evil heart of man according to Mark chapter 7 verses 21 through 22. These were individuals who were going about saying basically what you may have heard today. Well, God is a God of grace and you know he forgives. So I can continue to live with my boyfriend in a state of being unmarried and engage in sexual relations with him because God will forgive me. He is such a good God. It's that type of attitude. Now, I believe God is a gracious and giving God, but we never use the grace of God as a license for sin. The attitude of such a person in such a state ought to be, I know what I'm doing is wrong, and I need to repent. I need your prayers to help me to do that. I need to change my way of life. Not, oh, God is gracious and forgiving, and, he'll... and they go on fulfilling their fleshly appetites on the basis that God is forgiving, gracious, and good. That's what, what Jude here is saying is a destructive heresy because it sort of sanctions immoral living. It's like saying, okay, here, here's your grace card. <laughs> I don't mean Grace Bible Church, you know, <laughs> membership of <agree>. grace. <laughs> here's your grace card, and this is sort of your get out of hell free card. God is gracious, good, and forgiveness. And He is. And, and so often we blow it. And so often we have to come to Him and ask for forgiveness. But there's a difference between falling into sin, recognizing it's sinful, and seeking to repent of it or forsake it, and living in sin and justifying it on the grounds that God is gracious. I know it's wrong, but... And how dare you point your finger at me? After all, you're not perfect. Uh, you're right, I'm not. But I admit it. <laughs> And when I sin, I, I, I try to confess it and seek God's forgiveness. I don't justify it and say, oh, I'm going to do it because God is gracious and forgiving. They turn the grace of God into a license for immorality. Fifthly, they denied God's truth. In verse 4 again, it says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. 
And so not only do they change the grace of God, but they also pervert the truth about Jesus. And they deny him. They might say, oh, he's a good guy. Yeah, Jesus, man, excellent prophet. You know, just like Zechariah, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Man, he's right on par with all of those guys. Son of God? Nah. Nah, I can't go for that. You know, in Islam, they believe that Jesus was a prophet. A good prophet. Uh, he's a revered prophet. But the Son of God? No. God can't have sons. God's not a man that he would have children. God can't have sons. Well, these people were following that same kind of error. Denying Jesus Christ. And note the language that's used here. The only sovereign. This is the half-brother of Jesus again. And he refers to Jesus as the only sovereign and Lord. This is a remarkable claim to deity for Jesus Christ. The only sovereign and Lord. Jude is saying, this guy is equal to God. I mean, who was sovereign in the mind of the Jews? Jehovah. And Judas saying, this guy is the only sovereign and Lord. He recognized the deity of Jesus Christ, but false teachers don't. One of my major, major problems with Jehovah Witnesses. There are, areas, there are some areas that they're sometimes more right than some, some Bible-believing Christians. For example, where will we spend eternity? Oftentimes we say it's in heaven. Well, yeah, until, <laughs> until the end of the millennial kingdom. When the new heavens and the new earth come about and the holy city Jerusalem descends out of heaven to earth and we will live here on earth in some sort of paradise in the new Jerusalem. They make a big deal about that. I, that's not such a big deal. That's not going to keep me from going there or not going there. But if you deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that will keep you from going there. How do I know that? Right here, he calls it a destructive heresy. Right here, Jude says, these, this, these people, their condemnation has been prophesied about from long ago. There's no chance in Jude's mind for these people being true believers. They were with the Christians, sneaking in and among them to help promote their deceptive ideas. But they weren't genuine believers. And they didn't have salvation and they weren't going to heaven. You cannot deny the deity of Jesus Christ and be a born-again believer unless you have momentarily fallen into some sort of error. But you won't continue in that. You won't continue in that. You see, truth matters. We live in a modern era where there is a de-emphasis on truth, a de-emphasis on doctrine. Oh, I don't want to talk about doctrine. Give me seven points to help me at my job. You know? Give me five ways to get along better with my wife. Give me three points on how to make friends better. And the Bible ha addresses all of that. But people, don't talk about theology, please. Pastor Dean, it's just not relevant. It's not practical. And in our modern era, there's a de-emphasis on doctrine. And so people fall for error. And we have cults growing at an alarming rate. Whether it's Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventist. Or whether it's world religions like Islam and Hinduism and, and mysticism and even Satanism and the occult. Even in mainstream Christianity, we have a, a proliferation of female pastors that is increasingly growing to, and, and being more widely accepted, yet in, in direct contradiction to the teachings of Scripture. It's not popular to say that anymore, even in Bible-believing churches. People look at it, man, he's, a, he's an ultra-fundamentalist, isn't he? He doesn't believe that ladies ought to be preachers. No, I don't. Not over men. Beth Moore is an excellent Bible teacher. And she, her, she, her ministry is to women. And that's fine. But they're not to be pastors over men. And it never happened in the Church of Jesus Christ for the first 18, 19, it wasn't until 1956, the first United Methodist Church was the first group of people to ordain women to the gospel ministry. 1956. That, what were they saying then? They're saying, you know what? For 1,800 and some years, the church has been wrong. And all of a sudden, we are the enlightened ones who have reinterpreted 2 Timothy chapter 2. We now recognize it was purely cultural, and it's okay, ladies. You can be ordained to the gospel ministry. By the way, women are not inferior to men because God has restricted their role in the gospel ministry. That's the, only, that's the only area where he has restricted their role. But there are roles for men and there are roles for women and there are roles for children. 
And let me suggest to you that when you begin to knock down the role relationships between husbands and wives and men and women, you also have to knock down the role relationship between children and their parents. The Bible says, children, obey your parents for this is right. Well, why? They're equal to us, aren't they? I don't have to listen to you. That was cultural. It was just in those days, kids didn't go to school like we do. And Mom and Dad, I've studied some science that you don't even know about. Let me tell you, Mom and Dad, <laughs> what it's really like. Right? If you're going to knock down the role relationships between men and women, you've got to knock it down. Between, we, we have the false health and wealth, wealth and prosperity gospel. We have false beliefs about baptism and its necessity in relationship to salvation. We even now have a justification of homosexuality in relationship to ordaining openly practicing homosexuals. And they use the Bible to try to support it. I have had pamphlets and read those pamphlets on how they twist the scriptures into saying that homosexuality is not only okay, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So that not only can Christians practice it, but ordained clergy. You say, well, who does that? The Episcopal Church of America, one. The, the Lutheran Church, not the Missouri Synod or the Wisconsin Synod, the other one, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. The United Methodists are constantly debating it. Did you know that? At their general sessions, it comes up almost every year. You can read about it in theological publications. Fortunately, fortunately, they've held the tide there and said no each year. But the fact that it comes up and that there's a large number of Methodist pastors that think it ought to be approved scares me. And I would like to suggest to you that in another 10 to 15 years, a whole lot of, I think, a lot of Christians today think it's okay. Why? We've fallen for error. We're not contending for the truth. Doctrine isn't important anymore. Just love everybody. And, and we are supposed to love everybody. We are. I'm not trying to minimize that. But to ignore truth is to walk on dangerous ground. We need to be good students of the word. Jude says it's so important that we're to contend for the faith that once for all was entrusted to the saints. Let's pray. Father, in an era, almost an era of anti-intellectualism, an era of emotion, an era of ecumenicalism, where people just want to love everybody and feel good and hear good things and, and get along with everyone. We've maybe gotten to the place where we have wrongly so de-emphasized the importance of doctrine, of what the Bible actually teaches, and in the process of allowed for error. Father, I pray that you would help us to be good students of the Word of God. We realize that takes work. Help us to be willing to do that work. Help us to be willing to take time out of our busy days to do that which is most important, to study your word, to commit it to memory, to understand it better, and in the process, not only to be able to contend for the faith, but to know Jesus better. In his name I pray, amen. I hope that you'll join us for Sunday school. Don't forget on Sunday nights we're going through the book of Philippians. God bless you. If you're leaving, make sure you greet someone before you leave today.